Welcome to another edition of the Open Forum. Again, we have opportunity to look together into the Word of God, that wonderful, that precious Word of God, in order to discover truth. And my, my, what kind of truth are we finding today? We're really finding, you know, something that has never, never been known in years past. Never been known. We have been able to discover from the Bible a very precise timeline right up to the very last day so that we know the day and the month and the year when it's all over. We have discovered in learning about the timeline that uh, that there's a 23-year period, actually exactly 23 years, 8,400 days to be exact, that immediately precedes the very day of judgment, doomsday, that final day when God's wrath is poured out and finished on planet earth and uh, everything comes to a total end uh, at the end of the day of judgment and uh, we have learned much about that 8400 day period it is called in the bible a period of great tribulation uh, it is also called in the bible a time when the church judgment on the churches begin because all through that 8400 day uh, the satan is has been ruling in uh, that day period satan has been ruling in the churches and god has been sending those who remain there a strong delusion and but it is a period that is also called the hour of testing or the hour of trial we read that in revelation 3 verse 10 revelation 3 verse 10 because it is during that 23 year period that god is separating the wheat from the tares uh, the sheep from the goats if you will these are figures that god uses in the bible and uh, we're just learning all about this. You know, this is all brand new over the last few years. And and uh, so most many of us have never even heard of these things before. But they all come very much right out of the Bible. Now, I remember years ago writing a book called Wheat and Tares, in which I uh, discovered from the Bible that during this period of great tribulation, there would be... Uh, a mechanism put into existence whereby God would begin to separate the wheat from the tares in all of the churches. And that was the command to come out, come out of the churches. And at that time, I thought that was the big, big separating uh, command. But subsequently, uh, we're learning that there are other things that God is teaching by which he is continuing to make that separation. The whole business of time is a great test uh, because for 1955 years, the focus has been in the churches that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And now we learn that at this time in history, when the believers are to be warning the world the judgment day is almost here. God has given us very precise time and all kinds. Of, and so that command to watch and, and know about the time uh, is, again, a test. And all kinds of people, many of them who have come out of the churches, are not ready to relinquish the idea, oh, no, Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And so that command also is a test. But then on top of that, in the last several months, we're learning that God, that this is also a time when God is finally giving us a much, much information about God's judgment process that we had never known before. In fact, we're discovering that the, that the judgment process that 
uh, has been traditionally held by virtually all of the churches, uh, namely that all the unsaved will take their turn at the judgment throne of Christ, be found guilty, and then plunged into a terrible place of torment forever and ever and ever. That all of that is not what the Bible is teaching at all. We're learning all together uh, for, uh, uh, all kinds of things about judgment process that has never been known before. And again, that's a test. There are all kinds of people who have come out of the churches. They've even accepted the idea, yes, we can know the time when Christ is coming. But oh, no, oh, no, uh, for sure we have to keep the traditional position that there's going to be a judgment throne and all of that. And so these are all tests. Now, they're not tests for those who are really true believers today because a true believer wants to do the will of God. He wants, uh, and he may be very cautious about making changes in what he understands the Bible. He better be cautious. We're not just going to jump around uh, because somebody says so, we're going to examine it carefully uh, from the Word of God. But on the other hand, he's very much at home and very much relaxed, uh, uh, listening to what the Bible has to say and is, and is praying constantly, Oh Lord, help me not get in the way of truth. Uh, may I not come to the Bible with any preconceived ideas. Oh, Lord, just teach me from thy word. But And maybe there will be other tests before we're all done. We still have a little more than three years to go before Judgment Day. But that is what we're learning about the day in which we're living. We've been in this period of great tribulation for about 20 years, almost 20 years. We have a little more than three years to go. Wonderfully, of course, in the meanwhile, during the last 6,100 days of this 8,400-day period, there's a great multitude which no man can number. And most of them are coming uh, from people who knew very, very little about the Bible. They don't have a lot of preconceived ideas that get in the way of truth. Uh, they are just listening and they are uh, they are recognizing that what they're hearing comes from the Bible. They are praying and searching the Bible. And, uh, and, and uh, however God is doing this in their lives, it is a glorious time for them because they are becoming children of God and, and uh, therefore will never, never come into that day of judgment. Well, these are the very, very serious matters that we take up here on the Open Forum program. And I'm so glad that we can do this right out in the marketplace. We can look at this verse or that verse, but we want to look at them all together from the vantage point of the whole Bible and not just what we, or what we might think we know of the Bible. And, and, you know, it's amazing how much truth there is in the Bible, how much there is to learn. But wait a minute, this is your program. I hear I'm trying to make it my program. It's your program. Shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, greetings to you, Mr. Campion. How are you? Very well, thank you. I, I trust that by God's mercy you have um, gotten control of the acid reflux. Oh, that, that's, that's gone. Oh, praise that's the Lord. That's pretty much gone, yeah. Yeah, I have an observation and I have a question. Um, I, I th the observation is, um, I think that there's um, a little bit of a um, technical um, deficiency in the control room because sometimes um, people call and they're they're like talking to you, but apparently you're not hearing them. So many a time they get cut off and you didn't hear the question that they had. Well, we're, 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 nothing is perfect, you know, and, uh, and when we're taking calls from all over the country, coming in on all different phone lines, and then they have to be integrated into our system over here, and, uh, and, and so on and so on, it's not going to be a perfect system. I, I'll tell you, I'm amazed at we're, what we're able to do 
just because of modern technology, but but we do not have perfection, and uh, sometimes it may even sound like we're a bit rude. We never intend to uh, have any intention to be rude, but and we try our best. But uh, 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 this is the nature of who we are. We're only people, and we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. You just have to pray to God for that perfection. Um, my question is um, in Leviticus 26:20. In Leviticus 26:20, 20, Exodus, Leviticus 26:20. 20, there we read, and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. Now the context of this is that it's talking about the. Uh, what God's punishment will be if we rebel against him. And God uses a lot of pictures and portraits, figures of speech, to indicate his wrath, that the blessing is all gone. That And here again, your strength shall be spent in vain. Uh, and, uh, and, for example, during the five months of the day of judgment, it's going to be a horror story all over the world, and and anybody, uh, there will be, uh, of course, every attempt to try to continue life, uh, to uh, provide food and and uh, all the other amenities that, that are necessary for life, and yet everything is going to be upside down and in, in in uh, terrible de- uh, chaos and decay and uh, death will be everywhere. And this is the kind of thing that God talks about here, both in Leviticus 26 and also in uh, Deuteronomy 28. He just uh, he is using very lurid uh, language to describe how awful this world w- will be. So is this referring only to the five-month period, or is it also talking about the churches and congregations that were designed to bring the gospel, but they, they were not proclaiming the, the well, true it, doctrine, and so the, um, it, the, the land was not yielding its increase? Oh, I'm sure that there are spiritual meaning to some of these statements and many of the statements, and, and that is true that in the churches, spiritually, there is chaos. Uh, because they're not bringing forth spiritual fruit because God the Holy Spirit is not operating there. And I think that's a very valuable insight that you've offered there. And thank you. Does this in any way relate to um, Isaiah 9, 3? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 3. Uh, uh, Where it talks uh, of no joy of the harvest. Yes, there be no joy of harvest. Uh, no, well, uh, uh, the principle, of course, still would identify, uh, 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 but particularly in our day, as God's judgment has come upon the churches, are these things really taking place? But to some degree, any time we break God's law, we're going to get the judgment will come upon us. So to to some degree, I would say yes. That possibly is true. Uh, that is one of the reasons. That is one of the reasons that the harvest has been very thin, uh, very limited all through the church age. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Yes. Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you very much. Uh, I, well, first of all, I want to appreciate you for really exalting the name of Christ in wherever area that you go. And second of all, you have, you have challenged me to study the Word of God very, very carefully. The question I have is when Christ, before he was crucified, he was in the synagogue seen different times. However, when he was resurrected, has, the Bible doesn't indicate that he was seen in the synagogue any time. Do you know why? Well, the purpose of... Jesus staying on earth from the major purpose, according to the language of the Bible or what we see him doing, was to establish the fact that he had risen. Uh, we read this in, uh, in um, uh, oh, uh, uh, let's see, 
Uh, Acts chapter 1. Uh, le- let, me, let me look at that for just a moment. Let me look at that. Uh, Acts 1. We read... Uh, 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 talking about the day in verse 2 when he was taken up after he through the Holy Ghost had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also to whom now to the apostles he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now notice he focuses on the apostles. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, God picks up that thread, and there we read in 1 Corinthians 15, he says uh, uh, in verse 5 that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, After that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling or are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also. That was the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. Now, notice that God is not talking about the Pharisees or the priests or the synagogues, or the temple. Uh, It's talking about those who were most closest to him as true believers, that they would be absolutely assured that Christ had indeed, indeed risen, and that they in turn would carry that gospel out into the world. Christ has risen. His purpose for associating with the synagogue and the temple was all done. As a matter of fact, When Christ was hanging on the cross, uh, the veil of the temple was rent. That was that huge curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And that ended, that indicated that God was finished utilizing the nation of Israel uh, as a representation of the kingdom of God. And, uh, and of course, uh, the uh, temple and Jerusalem and all of that was the center of the nation of Israel. So we're not a bit surprised that there is nothing in the Bible about him visiting a temple or a synagogue or having anything to do with the Jewish nation as a nation, uh, but that he was more concerned about those who were the beginning of the New Testament church. Yes, sir. The second question is Luke chapter 2, verse 36. Luke 2. Verse 36 through 38. Look to verse 36. There we read, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of almost 84 years which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that look for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, what is your question? This 84 years typifying the uh, tribulation period, and she was in the temple, does this have any uh, spiritual significance? There probably is, but I would not be qualified to say what it was. I have not worked on these verses uh, 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 with any intensity at all, and and so I'm really not qualified. I I certainly see the 84 standing out there very strongly, and there probably is is a spiritual tie-in, but I would not I would not be able to say what that is. Okay, my last question is Acts chapter 27. Verse 37. Acts 27. Verse, verse which? Verse 37. Acts, Acts 27. 27 verse 37. Yes. There we read. There were in all in the ship 200, threescore, and 16 souls. That's 
276. And uh, that, of course, is a, uh, the 276 breaks down into some very, very key numbers. It breaks down into, uh, mm, let's see, 276, um, 12 I, times 23, 12 times 23. I was, and, I'm sorry. And, if you, oh, go ahead. And the number 12 has to do with the fullness of something. 23 has to do with judgment or with destruction. And the 276 on the ship were all saved. They are a picture of those who have come out of that destruction and still to live again. They're like the great multitude, which no man can number part of that. But the ship that they were in, which represented the churches, uh, God has used the ships uh, uh, to represent the sending forth of the gospel throughout the church age, was completely wrecked. There was no, there was just a board or two left of it. Uh, it was a, it was completely destroyed, and uh, it's focus. It really is focusing on that time. When God is finished with the churches, and yet there still is a great multitude that comes out of that time of, uh, of when he's finished with the churches that are still going to become saved. Now that 153 fish that you're talking about in John 21, if you take out 153 from 276, the remainder is 123. Does that convey the same idea that you just mentioned? No, no, that 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 kind of arithmetic would not uh, be warranted because 143, uh, uh, 123 breaks down into three times 41, and 41, uh, I'm not aware of having any spiritual meaning throughout the Bible, so I would not follow along on that kind of a calculation. Thank you, but thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, thank you. I just have a, uh, I want to start with uh, an observation and a little opinion and then one question. The lady called before, I think, the last caller and talked about the little flaws here and there that she hears on the, how the way the family radio operates. And Well, you know, I noticed that, uh, you know, I've visited the, the facility, and I've met you, and I've, you know, in the book 1994, I think that the way family radio is set up, it's to throw people off who are looking in the direction of perfection, you might say. It's because God always works with imperfection. So I always use that idea, the way the kind of little things that happen over the radio station and the, you know, dope form and the way it's all taught. Wow. You, well, so, now, we've got to be careful what we're saying here. You know, the Bible is perfect. God works well, yes. with the Bible. And it is a perfect book because it's from the mouth of God. But when God starts working with you and with me and with people, there's going to be imperfections because we're humans. And, and uh, that's the nature of mankind. And sometimes I wonder... How God gets so much done with imperfect humans such as we are, and uh, uh, but we know that uh, uh, God is in charge and He will get done what He wants to get done. Yeah. The reason I mention is, of course, you look at a, a, the you know prophets of Elijah and Jonah, and you know Moses, all imperfect people, but nevertheless God did use those people to make Him seem even more of a miraculous. Yeah, God, well, you, you, that's that's the point I make. Well, the point is that there are no perfect people named in the Bible. Yes. There were all they were all human. Even a man like Daniel or a man like Joseph, that was uh, the son of uh, Jacob. We don't read of any sin in their life, but that doesn't mean they were perfect people. Uh, and uh, but God is such a wonderful majestic, patient, uh, loving God, and He can uh, use us in our imperfections as well as what we do rather well in order to get His work done. But if we're going to look for perfection, 
look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Just look at God himself. But thank you for sharing that kind of a thought. And shall we take oh. our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Well, thank you. I was listening last night. A gentleman called about looking for a verse you couldn't find, a verse that states that Jesus will not be coming in the thief through the night. And I was wondering, well, if this, these conclusions that you have are right, even though you can't find the verses of the night, why can't the barcode be correct, even though it's not a verse in the book? No, the Bible does state it's a number of a man. And the number of a man, uh, the beast, of course, has 666. But we have uh, numbers such as um, the yeah, social well, security now, number. Excu excuse me. Man. Excuse me. Now, you're talking about a barcode. Uh, I remember the day when we got social security number. And everybody, all or all kinds, not everybody, but all kinds of people who try to read the Bible quite literally will say, Aha, you see, there it is, the mark of the beast. And, uh, and uh, 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 any kind of an identification number would cause that kind of a reaction. Now, the same kind of people or the same method of looking at the Bible also said that in his day, and uh, I'm old enough to really be aware of this, uh, in the Second World War, that Hitler was the Antichrist. Or, if you didn't like that, how about Mussolini, who was the premier of Italy, a Roman country? He was the Antichrist. And, of course, they were not the Antichrist. Uh, in his day, Kaiser Wilhelm in the First World World was the Antichrist, and and uh, 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 people all through history have tried to literally uh, look at the world to find answers to what the Bible was talking about. And they have always been wrong because they are violating a fundamental principle. When we are seeking an answer to a truth in the Bible, we never look outside of the Bible. We search the Bible. We compare Scripture with Scripture. And then, only based on what the Bible will allow, can we come to any kind of truth. Then sometimes after we have the truth and we look outside, we can see corroboration. But the truth has to come from the Bible. We have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum. A welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Cappy. How are you doing? You're very well. Okay. my I've got a couple of a few questions. Um, true believers are also sinners, are they not? I, I, I'm sorry. True believers are... Are also sinners, too, right? I mean... Well, they're... now, you know, we have to be careful about that. Because if someone... Uh, claims that they are a child of God. Oh, I love the Lord dearly, but I know I have sins, you know, because we who are true believers do have sins. And as, as if that's not a very serious matter. Uh, the, it is a fact, of course, that when we become saved, we our body was not changed, and it still lusts after sin. So if we take our eyes off Christ, we can fall into sin, big sin, believe you me. Uh, but that does not ever excuse that sin or make sin a light thing. It is a terrible thing. Now, bear in mind that before we're saved, both in our... In, in our entire personality, we loved sin. We're body and soul, and both in body and soul, we, we, uh, we love sin. We wanted to do our thing. We were in charge of our life. Thank you. Uh, we want to get the very best out of life as we understand it. Now, when we become saved, there's a mighty transformation that takes place, that God does. It has nothing to do with what we do. It has to do with what God does. He takes that old soul of ours that previously had lusted after sin just as our body and gives us a brand new soul. 
And in that new soul, we never want to sin again. That which is born of God cannot sin. We read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. And so that makes a powerful impact upon our life. It means that where before, if we were lusting after some kind of a sin, uh, uh, our, our whole personality was in agreement, so it was easy and comfortable uh, to go along with that sin as long as we didn't get into trouble with our neighbors or trouble with the law or something of that nature. We, 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 we simply want what we want. But now that we have become a new, ch- uh, have a new resurrected soul, when we start drifting towards sin, there's a terrible quarrel going on within our own personality. More than that, God himself now indwells us because we're a child of God. And he also puts pressure on us that we're not happy a bit with moving in that direction. And if we do go ahead and fall into that sin, we feel terrible. Uh, Read Psalm 51, which David penned after he fell into grievous sin because he took his eyes off God. And, uh, And we're not happy with that at all. So sin now becomes a big problem. We, 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 Uh, fear the Lord. That is, we hate sin. We want to try to do God's will more and more. And we're happiest when we are doing His will, when we're, we're most comfortable, when we are doing it the way God would want us to do. So you see, we don't, we don't just casually or incidentally say, well, you know, I'm a child of God, but children of God, they sin too. And and uh, no way, no way. We don't. N- we never look at sin casually like that. Once we are a child of God. Okay. okay my other question uh, is: In the end, I heard you say before that there'll be great earthquakes and many people will die. Do these people that have died and Lord knows what happens to them, but they die? Do they still come before God to be judged? There, you see, uh, this is one of the major pieces of information about judgment. We have always been taught the traditional view is that we're not really condemned until we have stood before Christ at the judgment throne at the end of time and been found guilty. And what we didn't realize was we hadn't read the Bible that carefully that it is the Word of God that judges and condemns us. The moment we commit a sin, the law says the wages of sin is death. So if I commit a sin and I'm still not, and and, and, uh, I'm an unsaved person, it means that I, that the moment I commit that sin, I am under the judgment of God. I am already condemned. I don't have to stand before Christ as the judge. I'm already condemned. Christ as the judge still has the task of making sure that the, that the penalty, the, the punishment for sin that comes when we have been condemned must take place and must be carried out to its finality, but he, we never have to stand before him in order to be officially judged. Okay, and one other question is that I've been listening to you for like three months, and I'm totally amazed about hearing that the world's going to end, and I've been trying to get my act together. I'm reading the Bible, and I'm trying not to sin, but... I don't know. I, I mean, I feel that I'm a true believer because I I, I was Catholic and I... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, here's the proper... Think again of the Ninevites. Read the book of Jonah. They were a wicked people. They knew very little about the Bible. Very, very little about the Bible. But here comes this strange prophet Jonah from the nation of Israel telling them... 
with all certainty that in 40 days, because of their sin, God is going to destroy them. Now, look what they did. They sat in sackcloth and ashes. That means they were broken in their spirit. They realized that, yes, we deserve that. We know we're sinners, and, and, and they were completely humbled by that, number one. Pride was all gone. That's, that's, that's the big thing in all of our lives is pride. Oh, my, it's an ogre. It's a monster in our lives. And, and it, it keeps us from, from crying out to God for mercy. But this is exactly what they did. They, they, their pride was broken. They sat in sackcloth and ashes and began to examine their lives and trying to straighten out and turn away from their wickedness and, and then praying uh, to God, oh, is it possible that you might change your mind? Is it possible? Have mercy, have mercy. And, and in their case, God did change his mind because the whole city uh, if, uh, uh, t took that kind of action in our day the whole world is not going to do that uh, the, word, the Bible clearly indicates that right up in all the way into judgment day itself people will be uh, will be blaspheming God and and yelling and screaming and and anger you know great anger at God uh, but individually it gives us an enormous promise if we would only look in the mirror and see our our stubborn pride we thought we were pretty good we thought we were pretty living a pretty fine life we thought we were decent moral and god ought to look with kindness upon him and now we realize no no we're sinners uh, we're we're uh, uh, we are shameful sinners. We've shamed the worm, word of God. We've shamed God. And now we piteously come to God. Oh, God, have mercy. Have mercy. Is it possible? Is it possible that I might become thy child? And, and as, we try, as we try to turn away from our sins, uh, try to do it God's way, and we, of course, we're going to want to know more and more from the Bible what is happening. And, and that puts us in an environment where, uh, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God so that God could save us if that is his good plan. But we don't come, uh, we don't come uh, with any assurance we're going to become saved. We come with a hope, a big hope that and maybe God will still save me, but we do not come with one speck of pride or self-esteem uh, or self-respect. You know, that sounds funny because uh, uh, that's the one thing everybody wants to be, have some self-respect. Hey, look, when we have shamed God again and again with our sins, what is there to respect about ourselves? Where we should be coming like the publican of Luke 18. Oh God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. In other words, I deserve the full wrath of God. But that's the hope that we have. And, and of, it wonderfully, and this is really a, a point of great joy, we read in the Bible that in this day, this very day that we are living, when we're so close to the end, there's a great multitude which no man can number that are being saved. And my, if that shouldn't give us a lot of hope if we're still unsaved. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. My question is, do numbers that are in time paths necessarily have to convey spiritually spiritually discernible truth that you are aware of? Do numbers have to teach spiritual truth? In time paths. Well, no, not necessarily. We have to look at the context in which that number is found uh, to see, because 
uh, a number doesn't stand alone teaching spiritual truth. It stands in the context of what of where it is found, and uh, uh, there are many times numbers are used in the Bible for other purposes and. And a lot of times, maybe they do teach spiritual truth, and we're not even aware of it. But uh, but uh, we 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 don't have to insist that every time we see a number, that it has to teach some kind of spiritual truth. Well, how about when it's used in a time path? It's used in a time path. Well, again, it depends. It depends on whether it it, it it can be used. You can, you for example, we know the dates of many, many important uh, 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 junctures in God's time plan. We know when a king uh, died and a new king arose. We know that date, and then we can compare that date with some other the date of some other king or some other event and we come to a number and maybe that number doesn't mean anything to us in other words spiritually it has to it has to break down into numbers that have spiritual truth inherent within them and secondly and this is very important it has to be in a context which which uh, is in harmony with the spiritual truth we're learning from those numbers. We just we can't play games with numbers. It isn't just a matter of of taking numbers and and trying to look at all the combinations we can find and but what what can we do with it? It's a matter of relating them to the spiritual truth of the Bible, and that. Uh, that works, uh, that uh, we do find quite a bit of spiritual truth that way. And many times we uh, see a number and, and, uh, or a time path uh, between two uh, events, and yet that number doesn't help us with any kind of spiritual truth. Well, uh, the number, the number uh, of Daniel 9, verses 25 and 26, is Dan- that part, are those all part of a time path? Let's see, Daniel 9. Daniel 9. And it's verse 25. Oh, uh, that, yeah, that, those numbers are very important, that, but that's a little different. That is, that is uh, indicating the uh, exact time from the the uh, spiritual meaning of building Jerusalem, which was the year 458 B.C., when Ezra was given by the, the command to reestablish the law in Jerusalem until the coming of Christ uh, in A.D. 33. That was exactly 490 years, seven sevens. And then there's also a time path from that same 458 all the way to the very end of time. And, and, and that has to be worked through very carefully. This is a very special uh, set of numbers here in uh, Daniel 9. And uh, but, these are part of a time path, the 62 sevens? Well, the 62 sevens, they are, uh, but the number 62 and the number... Uh, uh, 62 times 7. The number itself is not looked upon in this passage as a spiritual number. Uh, 62 is uh, 2 times 31, and I'm not aware that 31 is uh, particularly a spiritual number. It may be, but uh, it it doesn't. I don't see it in this passage at all. And uh, but it does give us a literal period of time. Of four hundred, of two hundred, let's see, uh, uh, four hundred and thirty-four years from uh, from the previous number and the next number. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Um, I just want you to know that you know I've been a loyal listener for a few years, and I am Jewish. You know, I did come out of the synagogue a few years ago. Um, do you think that's a good thing? Like, because you always talk about the end of the church age. Um, so it's, I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but like being in a synagogue as a, as a Jew, I, I shouldn't be in one. That's, is that correct? Well, 
Actually, God was finished with the synagogues already uh, 2,000 years ago when Christ went on the cross. He didn't utilize the nation of Israel anymore, uh, which was a Jewish religion, uh, to, uh, to externally represent the kingdom of God. And in 1988, when he gave the command to come out of the churches, uh, then he indicated that the churches no longer were to externally represent the kingdom of God. So they were put in the same class with the nation of Israel. Neither the nation of Israel nor the local congregations anymore represented, externally represented the kingdom of God. Now, whether you're Jew or Gentile today makes absolutely no difference. God is not a respecter of persons. A Jew does not have any advantage over a Gentile. A Gentile does not have an advantage over a Jew. Uh, God simply talks to the human race as people, as people. And uh, whether we're black-skinned or brown-skinned or white-skinned or whether we're blue-eyed or brown-eyed or whether we're a Jew or Gentile or whatever makes absolutely no difference. We all stand on the same ground as sinners who desperately need a Savior. And we all have the same opportunity to cry to God for mercy. Oh, that sounds... But thank now, you. Now, in a few weeks is the holiday of Purim. Is it okay to uh, celebrate Purim because it's not a feast day? So if, can I go to, say, a, a, a uh, Purim carnival in the synagogue and hand out tracts there? Because I just sent away for uh, your new Does God Love You tracts, and I really uh, love them. And, you know, I, I want to tell a lot of the Jews in the synagogues about, uh, you know, Judgment Day coming up, because I don't feel that, you know, the rabbis today really are telling them that. And then it's okay if I tell them to call the open forum so they could ask you questions? You know, because I, I think they're deceived, because, well, you know, like I said, I grew up in one, and we really weren't taught about any timelines or Christ coming, you know? So would you think that's a good idea to hand out tracts in the synagogue? Well, if they allow you to, my guess is they'll throw you out on your ear if you went into the synagogue to pass out Gentile or Protestant or Christian tracts. They, because, they that's a Jewish religion there. They're, they they do not accept Christ. They do not accept the New Testament. But they have to be witness to. And there are Jews becoming saved today, a trickle of Jews, just as there is a trickle of of, uh, from any nation and so uh, wherever you can but don't feel like you have a mandate don't feel like well now you know I got to get in there and make those people listen we never come that way with the gospel we uh, the Bible says don't cast your pearls before swine that is swine or is used in the Bible in the sense of those who are still unsaved uh, if if they don't want to if they don't want to accept a track if they don't want to listen don't press it on them uh, if they reach out because uh, as you're offering a track fine but uh, uh, we we are not to try to force our truths the truths we learn from the Bible on anybody but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, I'd be very interested in meeting that Jewish guy. If he lives in uh, Sunnyvale, I'll meet him at the Starbucks there at Wolf Avenue. Uh, I don't know where he was. Do you know where he was calling from? I'm sorry. This is an anonymous program. Please do not uh, You try to use it in any way to con contact with people. But thank yeah. you for calling well, and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Captain. Um, I just have a question about Acts 24, verses uh, 14 and 15. Acts 24, 14 and 15. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which were written in the law in the, and the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Now, what is your question? Um, what will the unjust be resurrected to? Well, this is, you see, 
This ties in with a verse like John chapter 5. John, let me turn, read John chapter 25. The hour cometh when all who... Well, let me turn to it. John 5 verse 28 and 29. The hour... The hour cometh... Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice uh, and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Now, the word resurrection commonly, we think about it as raising from death to life. Now, the unsaved who are dead do not come to life again. They are dead, both in body and soul. They are dead. But the word resurrection, uh, or, or a synonym uh, that's very close to uh, the word resurrection, is emphasizing a rising. They, are, they rise up. Now, it is true. The Bible does teach in a number of places that at the time that the true believers are resurrected to life because they have been given uh, eternal life and, and their bodies are resurrected, a glorified spiritual body that's eternally alive. At the same time, the remains or that which is in the grave, the bodies, the corpses, the bones or whatever is left is uh, of the unsaved are also r risen up but they're not risen up to life they are risen up simply to be further shamed in the eyes of God uh, it's, it's parallel to the language that we read in in uh, Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 8 or beginning in verse 7 we read there in Jeremiah 7, uh, uh, in verse 34, Then will I cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. Now, this is all, talk, all of this language is talking about the true believers, and they are raptured. And at the same time, and it, go, it goes on, and at that time, this is chapter 8, verse 1, saith Jehovah, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah. They, who are they? Well, God, God is a triune God. Uh, he frequently speaks of himself in the plural, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of the princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, out of their graves. In other words, they're going to rise out of their graves, the remains uh, and and they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven whom they have loved and whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. And death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family. That is, those who are still physically alive, entering into the day of judgment, they too will be facing the fact that they're about to die and their death is the end of them. Now, the, uh, the fact that the bones can hear the voice of God and come forth, we read in Ezekiel 37, where God is, is speaking uh, in Ezekiel 37, behold, I will cause, uh, or he says in verse 4, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now look, he's talking to dry bones. 
There's no life in them, but they're going to hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, the Lord Jehovah, unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Now, that's talking about the true believers. But at the same time, there will be bones that hear the word of the Lord. They will not have breath come into them, but will be commanded to rise. They'll be thrown out of the tombs like manure on the ground. Thank you, Brother Captain. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi, Harold. I have a couple questions. Um, uh, if we didn't have the Bible, uh, we wouldn't know what the will of God is. Is that true? True. Well, we would not know. We'd know a little bit because God's law is written on our heart. We do have a conscience. Intuitively, no, we know some things are right and some things are wrong. But we wouldn't have any idea of the multitudinous information that we get from the Bible. And in but oh, hold on, right, we've got to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum. We have a caller in the line. Go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, uh, the idea that uh, without the Bible, human beings would not be able to be saved, even though they have a conscience of right and wrong. Is that correct? Uh, without the Bible, they wouldn't know they have a conscience? Well... It's not a question of what they that they know they have a conscience. The fact is they would have a conscience because mankind is created in the image of God. He knows intuitively he has uh, to uh, to stand over against God uh, for his life. He he knows there's going to be an end of the world intuitively. He knows uh, these things. Now he can deny these things like crazy because. Uh, he doesn't want to be uncomfortable with these ideas. He can become an atheist or an evolutionist or something. But nevertheless, deep in his heart, he knows there is a God because God created us. We're not like an animal. An animal does not recognize there is a God. They only are physical being with the breath of life. That's it. But we are a physical being with the breath of life, and we have a soul. And, uh, and in that soul, we were created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. And even though it's been severely uh, uh, maligned and, and, and changed because of our sinful nature, nevertheless, we still have a spiritual conscience. But that the conscience is not enough to be able to help a man becomes saved, correct? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We need to know about the Lord Jesus. That's why the Bible commands us to send the gospel into all the world. Faith cometh by hearing, and faith has to everything to do with the Lord Jesus, and hearing by the word of God. And if there is not the hearing of the word of God, there will not be salvation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Campin. Yes. Shall we go to uh, Jeremiah 8? Jeremiah 8, uh, starting from verse 7 to um, are you, 9. Are you talking about the book of Jeremiah? Yes, sir. Chapter 8? Yes. All right, let's turn to that. Jeremiah 8, around verse 7. Yes, to 9. To 9. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed hour times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of Jehovah. How do ye say? We are wise, and the law of the Jehovah is with us. Lo, certainly in vain made he. The pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they are 
They have rejected the word of Jehovah and what wisdom is in them. Now, what is your question? Can you explain that for me, please? Well, yes, you see, God is saying that even in the natural world, there's a certain knowledge, say, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, uh, birds, that they uh, that they have a uh, they they know when they have to make a nest because they're going to be bearing uh, be be bearing young. Uh, they know when they have to fly to another place where uh, they are to nest. Uh, they there there is built within them a knowledge of time. But mankind, because he is wiser than God and he is listening only to himself rather than carefully searching the Bible does uh, I, is, is, thinks they think they know a whole lot and they don't know at all they, if we're going to find truth we've got to get it from the Bible and uh, otherwise we're, we're going to be like in verse 9 the wise are ashamed that is those who are wise in their own eyes who are who are really thinking in their little peanut minds, which we only have as compared with the infinite mind of God, that they know as more than God. And so they're not listening to the Bible when God talks about time or about judgment and about a whole lot of other things also. And thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Capping. How are you? Yes, go ahead with your call. Yes, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, yes. Let me turn to that a moment. Ecclesiastes, and which verse? Chapter 5. Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Now, what is your question? Camping. Now, how does that relate to Esther chapter 1, verse 13? How does that relate to... The book of Esther chapter, thir- uh, chapter 1, verse 13? Oh, I don't know. Let me look at that a moment. The book of Esther... Let's see, the book of Esther. I haven't looked at that for a long time. Let's see, that comes after Ezra, Nehemiah. That's Job. Job. Esther chapter 1, verse 13. There we read, Then the king said to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that new law and judgment. And next to him was Carson and so on and so on. What shall we do with the queen Vashti according to the law? Now, how does that relate? I don't know. I have never really tried to relate these two passages, although they obviously do relate. I do know that the book of Esther gets into the end of time, but from a different vantage point, it does raise up talk about Haman, who was a vile, vile person who ruled and who typified Satan. He had ten sons, and they were all hanged and and. And that all focuses on the end of the world. And uh, so uh, there are there are tie-ins, but I'm not qualified at all to try to tie these two verses together. I'd be only speculating. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hi, my question is this. If you come out of the church, then uh, where do you meet with other Christians? Would that be okay, like a home Bible study? Well, sure, you can have a home Bible study, but be careful 
that you don't try to make it a pseudo or para church. Be sure you don't have a membership. You don't have anybody there who has the spiritual authority over others. Okay. Uh, like an elder or a deacon, you don't offer the uh, the uh, ceremonial laws of the water baptism or the Lord's table. Be sure that it is just a meeting to talk about the Bible together in a, some kind of a, a, a the Bible that that certainly would not be prohibited. It, although the Bible does not encourage in any way that during this time that we are to seek out others, we are to particularly focus on our fellowship with God. I it's see. God okay. and me. Okay. Thank okay, well, no, my, I was wondering, because I'm a single person, and then I would be alone a lot, so, you know, that's not always, you know, productive and healthy. So, uh, uh, you know, I usually well, get together with, um, hopefully, other Christians, yeah, no, and, no, uh, you no. know, we share in the Word of God. Now, let me ask you a question. The world has got almost 7 billion people in it. Uh-huh. A great portions of it, at least about two-thirds of it, have never, never heard any or learned anything from the Bible. They don't uh, so identify with Christian Christianity at all. And yet, out of them, there is coming a great multitude, which no man can number, who are true believers. So here's an individual back in India or in... Pakistan or in Philadelphia or New York or wherever it may be, who has never heard, uh, never attended a church, knows no other Christians of any kind, and he's listening to the truth of the Word of God, and God saves him, because God is saving a great multitude just exactly that way. Now, what's that person going to do? How's he going to find another believer? He's not going to be able to find another believer. He doesn't, he doesn't, uh, there's no way to, to, but is he now bereft? Is he now, uh, now uh, been given a, 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 a bum deal by God in some way? The answer is no, no. Our fellowship is with, how do we read it in First John chapter 1, verse 3? Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, the Lord Jesus. We can open our Bible and our lap and read uh, read carefully, and we can just know this is God speaking to me. And we can be praying, and that's us speaking to God. Now we're having conversation. Oh, Lord, help me to understand this a little bit more. Help me to be obedient to what I find here. And in other words, we're not distracted by what other people are saying. We are focused entirely on the Bible. And we can listen to programs from Family Radio, for example, which will encourage us into looking at this part of the Bible or that part of the Bible in order to find truth there. Truth, right, because um, ho- the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. The Holy Spirit is the one who opens our eyes and, and, and strengthens us. And, you know, it's so wonderful to just go to the Lord. Oh, Lord, I don't know anything. Oh, Lord, uh, I, I, uh, all I know is, is that the Bible is your word. It's totally truthful. And, and, oh, Lord, help me to understand a little bit more of it. And, and uh, then uh, uh, 20 minutes later, when I begin to feel lonely again, I can cry again to the Lord. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Help me uh, to, uh, to want to read your word more and so, more. And so, so, Brother so Camping, if, the, if two Christians got together and went out to witness, that would still be okay, yes? Because Jesus it's, sent it's, them it, out by two. It's not saying that we should not do okay. that. Okay. But I want to make, I'm trying to emphasize that that is, a, is simply a, a dream uh, that cannot be realized in the hearts of most people who are becoming Christians today because they don't even know anybody else who is a mm-hmm. Christian. And so right. we don't have to think for a moment that we're being defrauded in any way if we don't happen to know someone else who is a true believer. 
Oh, okay then. Thank you okay. for calling okay. in, Okay, thank you, Brother Camping. Yeah, and shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello. I'm on the air? Yes, go ahead with your call. Yes, hi, Brother Camping. Uh, I've been listening to you since 1988, and I followed. I've gotten your book, 1994, and Are You Ready? And I've read a lot of your material. I've thoroughly studied it, and... Um, I'm going to say this very humbly because I mean absolutely no harm, but you were wrong about 1994. And from what I'm seeing that the scripture says, how do I humbly tell you in family radio and your listeners that you were just as wrong regarding the things you're saying now? Your timeline is 100% correct, but the doctrine that you're associating with it is very erroneous. In what possible way can I get the information that the Holy Spirit has revealed to me unto you and your listeners, if that's at all possible? Well, uh, you every, I don't want anyone to believe me, of course, because I'm a teacher. I want them to believe the Word of God. And so I put down uh, what, I, what I discover in the Word of God so people can examine that. And, uh, and of course, as we go along, we learn more and more and more from the Word of God. When you, were, when I wrote the book 1994, I knew very, uh, I, uh, many of the things I wrote about in 1994 I still hold today without any change at all. But then some things are, I do not hold because during the ensuing years I have been studying and studying and studying and we've been talking about this together on the open forum. And so, uh, again and again, uh, uh, other books have been written, like The End of the Church Age or Wheat and Tares. And now we've uh, just published this little book called We're Almost There. And anybody can read. Uh, it'll direct them into the Word of God, and they can make their own decision. They have to make their decision. I'm, I'm not going to decide for them. I don't rule over anybody. I simply am teaching as I discover from the Word of God. And you'll notice if you listen, there's something different about this teacher from others that you hear very, very, very seldom. Have you ever heard a preacher or a Bible teacher say, I was wrong? I, back then, I'm, I was mistaken. And yet you hear me say that again and again because we happen to be living in a time when God is taking the seals off of the Word of God and there's a, a lot of new information pouring out which shows that we, uh, uh, not only I, but all the others who were teachers uh, and taught those particular doctrines like what judgment day is all about uh, we uh, we were wrong we were wrong and I don't hesitate to say I was wrong because I I I, I don't have any claim uh, as an authority I, I just follow the Bible and the Bible what does the Bible say of itself all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for teaching and for correction. And who is the first one that better be corrected? Not the one I'm preaching to or teaching. Me, the teacher, better be corrected. And very humbly, I better admit when I need correction because I'm not the authority. The Bible is the authority. So, uh, uh, you you have to make your own mind up if you want to listen uh, to your hold on to your preconceived ideas uh, and you don't want to investigate further. That's your privilege. You can do that, but I'll tell you, uh, it's very it's a very serious matter what we're how we're looking at the Bible today. And every better buddy better be in a position where they're ready to be corrected. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Me and my family, every night we read the Bible, and I was just wondering, how do we know that we're saved? 
how do we know that we are saved? Is that your question? Yes. How do we know that we're saved? That's a very, very important question. And, you know, the throughout the church age, the, the position of the churches has been, and it still is today, we will show you how to become saved. You do this, you do that, you say that, you pray that, uh, and you join our church, and you become a faithful member, and we will assure you that you've become a child of God. And all of that is not true. Nobody can show someone how to become saved. Uh, salvation is something that God does entirely. And the evidence of salvation is not that I've joined a church, not that I've become baptized in water, not be that I am this or that, but that I have an intense desire to do the will of God. And where is the record of the will of God? Where do we look for? We look to to find the will of God, the Bible. And so we're constantly ready to correct a doctrine that we hold or a, 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 a practice that we follow uh, to be more accurate in the Word of God. And that's our desire. Or to say it the other way, if we find that we're doing something contrary to the Word of God, we feel very terrible about it because in our new resurrected soul, which does come to every single individual that does become saved, there is that intense desire to do the will of God. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brad Camping. Good evening. Yes. I have about three questions for you, and my very first question is about tithes and offerings. And uh, I've been a very keen listener to your program. About tithes much... and offerings. Now, you see, throughout the church age, the idea of bringing our offerings was in order to get the gospel out into the world. Unfortunately, that's not where the tithes uh, did, always went to. A lot of it went just for self-serving, having a more beautiful building to worship in and and uh, paying our, our getting a little more uh, uh, well acquainted acclaimed a pastor and so after we have to pay him a bigger salary and and so on and so uh, most of the, or very frequently very little money really went into trying to send the gospel out into the world but that's really the purpose of tithing is to get the gospel out into the world. We are to lay our lives down on the altar of service. As we read in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual service. And that's what, we, uh, that's what tithing is all about. Now, today... We have a big message we have to tell to the world. Judgment Day is almost here. Every true believer is like Jonah today in Nineveh. Forty days, God is going to destroy you. Or like, jo like Noah was in Noah's day, that in seven days the flood is going to come. You, uh, and, uh, and so we too should be telling it to the world. Judgment Day is coming, but... There's still a wonderful possibility of salvation because the Bible teaches it like in Revelation 7 that at this time there is a great multitude which no man can number that are being saved. Yes, Brother Camping. Um, I am not belonging to the local churches and I'm glad you did advise after following your advice. I followed the... The teachings, and I, I am not belonging to the local churches, but my problem now is, am I sinning? Am I robbing God by not paying tithes and offerings? Well, I do. Well, um, I, I, I can't tell you what, whether you're uh, the, the robbing God, uh, uh, 
see, some people get the idea that if I just do this and that, then God is pleased and everything is well. It's a whole attitude. The fact is, first of all, we start with the principle that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, who's our neighbor? Anyone who has a need. What is the need that mankind has? Uh, salvation. Uh, and uh, and uh, how do we love ourselves? The highest good that we've got for ourselves in our self-love is that we've come to know Jesus as Savior. Oh, uh, we've arrived. We're eternally secure in the Lord Jesus. And, and now we should have that love for our fellow man. And that's where it all begins. It has to begin in our heart. This is not a mechanical thing where we take our our paycheck and we divide it up and take 10% and say, well, this, I'm going to give this for missions and, and, uh, and then I'm all safe and secure. I'm doing God's will. No, no, it has to be, you know, uh, there's a world out there that's lost and, uh, and, uh, God has commanded me as a child of God to send the gospel out. How can I do that? I want to be praying for wisdom about that. Can I, provide Bibles here or there, or can I uh, uh, help uh, this or that ministry that is still faithful, altogether faithful to the Word of God, uh, as they are, are able to get the gospel out. And, and it's something that we should be praying about, but always with an attitude of love for our fellow man, an intense desire that many, many others might come to that glorious position of being a child of God. But shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead with your call. Oh, my, we lost that call. We have time for one more quickie. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I just had a question. Um, I've been desiring to be saved for many, many years now, and it just hasn't happened no matter how much I prayed and, and, and read the Bible, and I've listened to this program for many years also. Well, but you see, uh, uh, we have to wait upon God. You know, we, we're, we're living in the day of instant pudding. We want When we want something... We want it right now, or at least by next week. And that isn't the way God works. In fact, we have to start out with the fact, I don't deserve salvation. I am a sinner. I have shamed God, and I deserve hell. And yet, is it possible? Is it possible that God might save me and, and oh, Lord, have mercy, have mercy. And I keep praying, and I wait upon him. Let me give you a verse that is a, a beautiful verse that, uh, that is, uh, has a, a larger meaning than what I'm giving it right now, but it also applies to this idea in Lamentations chapter 3. There we read in verse 26, It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of Jehovah. In other words, we have a big hope that God is saving a great multitude today, and that could mean me also, but I have to just wait upon him. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night. Good night.